Hello and welcome to a bonus edition of the Arsenal Women Arsecast on Arsblog.com. Special edition looking ahead to this Sunday's FA Cup final between Arsenal and Chelsea at Wembley Stadium. It doesn't get much bigger than that. The two teams have met at Wembley a couple of times, of course, in the FA Cup final in recent years in 2016. Arsenal 1-0 winners thanks to a screamer from Arsenal legend Danielle Carter. Two years later, the teams met at Wembley again in the 2018 final. Chelsea 3-1 winners on that day. Um, So really big, exciting game coming up at Wembley Stadium. For those of you who are wondering why the FA Cup final is taking place in December and who perhaps aren't familiar, this is actually last season's FA Cup final. But what happened was because of the uh, lockdown during the early part of 2021 in England, um, football that was considered below elite level, so semi-professional and amateur, was suspended. And that included um, a lot of women's football clubs in the early rounds of the FA Cup. So basically the FA Cup was delayed for a couple of months last season. So what the FA did was they squeezed in the, the... they got up to the fifth round basically at the end of last season and they've played the quarter final the semi-final and the final in the first half of this season and actually a a fairly nice touch Um, this Sunday's final is going to be played on the 100th anniversary of the English Football Association banning women's football a ban which survived for 50 years in the end so uh, really good of the FA actually to pick such a poignant date but that's not really what we're going to focus on on this podcast we're going to be talking about Arsenal versus Chelsea and we're going to have some very special guests to do that so in the first part you will hear me Tim Stillman talking to Arsenal left back Steph Catley Um, and we talk a little bit about obviously about the game about uh, facing up to her international teammate Sam Kerr Um, interesting kind of uh, 18 months for Steph at Arsenal she was injured for most of last season obviously with Covid not able to get home to Australia to see her family so we talk a little bit about that as well as the hamstring surgery she underwent and then in the middle we will be getting the Chelsea viewpoint from Jesse Parker Humphreys and Jesse is a really good women's football journalist who you can read in the independent in 442 on the offside rule um, also on uh, the WSL podcast uh, box to box which Alex is on um, and 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 also as part of the London is blue podcast so we Alex, Jesse and I really kind of chew over the game, what we think the starting lineups are going to be, where we think the key battles are going to be, etc, etc. And then at the end, you'll get me again speaking to Arsenal right back Noel Maritz. Now, Noel, a player I'd, I'd not spoken to before. Um, again, some of you may not know. You may know uh, Noel as a Swiss international, which she is, and obviously her name uh, would suggest the, that she's Swiss. But um, some of you may not know that she was born and raised in California, and that's where she lived for the first 10 years of her life. So obviously Cali accent. <laughs> so for those of you expecting a, a strong Swiss accent, uh, that's not what you'll get because Noel was born and raised in the U.S., um, but really good interview with Noel as well. And I, I just want to say before we start the episode, a big thanks to Arsenal um, and Daniel Lane at Arsenal for, for giving me time with Steph Catley and Noel Maritz ahead of this game for this podcast. So a bit of a bumper edition for you uh, to preview this Sunday's FA Cup final with Chelsea. And if you still haven't got tickets and you can go, go they're still on sale around 40,000 sold at the time of recording uh, very reasonably priced and Arsenal men are not playing that weekend they don't play until the Monday night away at Everton so uh, get the kids down there get the partner down there get everyone down there um, and and really kind of uh, create an atmosphere at Wembley because it's going to be a really big day and it's going to be a really tight game I think that's going to be going to be decided by small details but for now um, I'll leave you with my interview with Steph Catley then we'll go into the chat between Alex uh, Ibaceta, Jesse Parker Humphreys and I Uh, And then we'll finish with the interview with Noel Maritz. And don't forget, we'll have another episode out for you early next week, looking ahead to the Barcelona game at Emirates Stadium next Thursday. And that will feature another very special guest, Lotta Wubben Moy. So do keep an eye on your podcast provider for that. But without further ado, here's me speaking to Steph Catley. 
my, my first question I wanted to ask was um, obviously thinking back to last season um, where you had uh, issues with your hamstring, which which um, you needed surgery on. What mm-hmm. what exactly was the issue? Like, what was the timeline um, of that injury, and and what was the surgery seeking to solve? Yeah, so basically, I mean, I had obviously a, a very rough year last year with injuries. The the first problem was actually my calves. So I had a, a few recurring calf injuries that just kept popping up and setting me back. And then when I was finally through most of that, I got into the point where I was coming off the bench a bit and starting to get proper minutes and sort of was almost ready for my first full 90 and then at training, I took a corner and I just tore my hamstring, com- like completely tore it. So it was a grade three C um, and it needed surgery um, just to, it had retracted up. So that's usually means it needs surgery because it doesn't heal as well as on its own. So obviously a really, really big injury and a big setback. And um, after all the other injuries that I'd just come through, it was pretty hard to take. And um, yeah, it was a long, long road back but you know I think uh, I, I put in the hard work and I I got to a point where now I feel like my body's in a really good in a good place and I did everything I needed to do and now touch wood I'm healthy and um, hopefully no more setbacks. <laughs> Anna you kind of referenced it there but last season I mean it must have been pretty tough for you to make this, this you know big decision to come to Arsenal next phase of your career and then like to be injured and to have like COVID on top of that and the extra challenges that's particularly brought for Australians as well. I mean, how, how, how was it for you last season? Yeah, it was, it was very, very challenging. Um, you know, it was one of the most exciting moments in my career coming here and, um, you know, coming to Europe for the first time and, and putting myself out there and really looking to challenge myself and get settled and obviously, you know, it was almost day one of preseason where my calf decided to give up on me and then um, it was just a, a slog from then on. And then obviously with COVID coming over here, we we didn't know that we'd be in the situation we would be in with not being able to see our families. Um, obviously COVID as a whole for everyone is difficult with all the lockdowns and all of that. So I suppose being injured, not being able to see my family, the lockdowns, like it did all sort of pile on top. And it was difficult, but, you know, I'm lucky to be at such a good club. I was surrounded by incredible medical staff and, um, you know, my teammates are just the best and my partner's over here as well. So I was very lucky to have someone to come home to and, um, you know, have that time away from football as well, just to, you know, focus on other things and and stay smiling and happy while um, obviously not being able to see my family and stuff, which is difficult. And like how important, um, particularly during that period, was um, not just like Caitlin and Lids, but, you know, the other Australian players that are playing in London, like that little kind of mini uh, community you formed. How important mm-hmm. was that as a support network? Yeah, extremely important. Um, there's just, you know, something about the girls that I've grown up with, you know, the national team that are over here. It's like a a little family and um, we do get together a lot and go out and have dinner and um, have that time away from football together. And it's just people, you know, that, you know, you've had in your life for a long time, so you can lean on them no matter what. And especially last year when we were all missing our families and all not being able to, you know, go home and touch base with the people that we love. It was, it was lucky that there were so many of us over here to kind of keep that communion and um, stay close to each other. And now, um, you know, you've been in the WSL for 18 months now um, and got, you know, more game time this season. Um, Having spent a lot of time in the NWSL, what are the main differences, do you think, between the WSL and the NWSL in in the US? Yeah, I think um, the playing style is pretty different. Like in America, it's very, um, I think it's, faster pace in terms of like a tr- more of a transitional game you know the girls that come out of college and that you know the Americans in general are just such athletic beasts like it just makes the game so fast and um yeah every game you feel like you've run a marathon and <laughs> almost like a cross-country sprint but um here I think is a bit more tactical um you know especially playing here at Arsenal you have to you know learn to break down a lot of different systems and 
a lot of teams, you know, putting a lot of bodies behind the ball. So I think tactically, technically, um, that requires you to be really switched on and really sharp all the time um, in all of those aspects. So, I mean, you, you definitely have aspects of that in America, but it's just, I would say that's the, the slight difference. And maybe the, the difference in, I think, in America, the from team to team, they're quite well spread out in terms of the national team players and stuff like that. So I think it's very competitive in that sense. And obviously here it's it's very competitive, but there is quite, there's a, a gap between probably, you know, top four or five, whatever it is going down, which is probably a slight difference as well. And um, I mean, another thing about last season was obviously you were kind of brought in, Katie McCabe had been playing left back. And I think the um, when I spoke to Joe a lot about this, I think the intention was very much that Katie would play further up and you'd come in and be the left back. Obviously that that couldn't happen. <laughs> and then Katie ends up yeah. playing at left back all season, gets player of the season. Was that, um, I don't want to say was that difficult, but was was there a sense of like watching Katie play like that and in the form of her career? Like, was there a part of you that was thinking that that could have been, that should be me? I mean, of course, you can't help it. You know, that's that's the position I play. And obviously I'd come there to play and, um, would you know, it'd be, I would have loved to have played with Katie on the left side. And um, obviously when you're injured, you, you think about that and you think, oh, God, I just wish I was able to play and do this. But it's also so nice being, you know, teammates with Katie and watching her, you know, reach that kind of form and play career best football you, you always want to see your teammates doing well in that kind of situation and for me as a player it just helps me to get better as well and to grow and push you know we push each other and um, make each other better in, in that sense but obviously sitting back and not being able to do anything and train not being able to train and stuff watching it is difficult but I was so so happy for it and um, you know seeing her grow as a player has been something incredible she's still in career best form and doing amazing so um, you know, the more players we can have in career best form doing things like that, the, you know, the more likely we, we are to win things. So can't go wrong. And uh, I mean, I, I want to talk um, a little bit about the Matildas as well um, recently. And obviously you had the Olympics and, um, you know, uh, there were a few kind of, I guess, strange results having not played for so long and under a new coach. But I, I get the sense watching you guys that there's a momentum building um, at the moment and particularly with that kind of, 2023 World Cup on the horizon is that um is, is that how you feel and is that how you felt during the Olympics as well yeah absolutely I think you know the challenges coming into the Olympics were really large I think you know obviously having the new coach like you said we hadn't been together in so long so we came together in a pre-camp in Sweden and just had a good month together and I think that was really good for us. Obviously not seeing each other for so long, we were all really keen to be back in camp and wanted to get something out of the Olympics, you know, we're all fit, all healthy, um, which is which is really rare for us. So I think everyone sort of got a buzz about that and felt good going into the tournament, like we could really um, achieve something. And I think that's a common theme for our team right now is that, you know, we have got this generation of players that are over in Europe playing, doing well, and we feel like we can do something together as a national team and win something significant. And now is kind of that opportunity. And we definitely felt like that going into the Olympics and tactically we felt great within each other. Individuals are playing well. So we got very, very close. I think fourth is the worst possible place you can finish at an Olympic games, but um, yeah, it was still something that we can look back on and be proud of. Um, eventually but we do we do want to keep pushing and keep building on this momentum leading into that 2023 world cup because that's it's a big moment for us yeah yeah definitely and um for, for you guys as well um that you know the two games against brazil recently and and the first time i, I appreciate it wasn't home home but the first time you know being able to go back um to oz how um how important was that for you, I get for all of you, I guess mentally, um, as much as anything? Yeah, I think going back to Australia has been really great for some of us. It, it was a challenge in a sense that it wasn't, like for a fair few of us, it wasn't home home. So going all that way and not being able to see family was an interesting experience and pretty challenging in itself. But um, there's nothing like 
home soil and, you know, for our national team playing in front of home fans, the sun, especially now the sun's going away here for, for Australians, it's, it's vital. (laughs) So that little dose of sunshine was, um, yeah, it was really nice. And all the girls back here were very jealous of our tans when we got back. So um, yeah, little dose of home never hurts, but this, this time around against when we're going to play against the U S the borders are sort of opened up in Australia now. So uh, most of our families can come in and say hi. So that'll be nice. Great. Yeah. 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 My, my wife's Brazilian. So um, I'm, yeah like i'm getting to understand how important sunshine is for people (laughs) from sunnier places and we're going there for christmas um this year the first time she'll been back in over two years so um, yeah yeah it's yeah and a little bit of christmas sun um yeah Yeah. gonna be great um another thing that's that's really kind of jumped out i think at most people watching arsenal this season is like the improvement in set pieces Mm -hmm. um and obviously you're a big part of that um, as, as someone who delivers set pieces. And I have to say, it wasn't a, an area of your game that I'd appreciated before, um, mm. like the corner taking. And obviously in Denmark, scoring your first goal for the club uh, with a pretty nice free kick. How much is that something that, that you particularly um, really work on in training? Yeah, um, it's been... Uh, I mean, the free kicks, I've the last maybe four years have you know, consistently practice those in training. Um, I probably started back in Melbourne city, just hitting a few every day after training from that exact spot that I took it in Denmark and doesn't often land exactly in that spot. So the game against Denmark, when it landed there, I was just like, okay, when am I ever going to get the chance to take it from the exact spot? I always put it at training. (laughs) So it was nice that it landed there. Um, I should probably start trying from other places now that I've gotten one goal there. So um, that'll probably be next on the list. But uh, corners and stuff, I think I've mostly started really focusing on them with the national team. Tony puts a lot of emphasis on our set pieces and um, demands high quality and um, a certain type of ball is in different types of games. So um, that challenges me and I'm, I'm taking a lot of corners with the national team. And that means that when, whenever I need to for, for Arsenal, I'm, I'm ready to take them and, and deliver, you know, quality balls. And um, I, I just asked Noel, uh, Noel a, a similar question here about, obviously there's been like um, a change in style slightly under Jonas in terms of that, that kind of high press. And I wondered, first of all, whether that's had an impact on your game at all, or whether it's just um, really been the same, but also, I guess, you know, you were brought over here by a coach you knew really well um, in Joe um, and now playing under under Jonas. Like, how much of an in- adjustment tactically has it been an adjustment at all under Jonas? And what's it been like, I guess, having come over here with a coach you knew so well to work under someone completely new? Yeah, I mean, it's always an interesting situation, but I think, uh, I think the national team set up kind of um, prepares you for situations like that and for having to play different styles and switching from one to another. So I think over the years I've become quite adaptable to that kind of stuff and just getting used to playing different styles. Um, the high press is something we've done with the national team for a long, long time. So that comes quite naturally to me and that there's not much with what Jonas has brought in that I haven't previously done in other teams. And um, obviously knowing the girls around me now for a little while, um, that helps with with a lot of different things, knowing how they play and uh, in their patterns of movement and stuff like that. So that's obviously very helpful. Um, yeah, obviously it's different when you you sort of sign for one coach and then they they don't really stick around for long. And I barely got to play under Joe anyway because I was off injured the whole time, which is obviously not ideal. But you know, Jonas has come in and um, brought such a, a positive, energetic vibe. You just, he makes you want to play for him and, and it's been quite a, a seamless transition really and you can see the way that we're playing, it's very positive and everyone's having fun out there. So, yeah, it's been good. And um, obviously looking ahead to the, the cup final against Chelsea at Wembley, I mean, in terms of the schedule, I mean, you're, you guys like, I mean, I, I go to all the games and I feel like my feet haven't hit the ground for the last few weeks. <laughs> 
just on the churn of traveling to them. So (laughs) preparing for them. But have you had a chance to think yet about, you know, the the occasion? I don't know if you've played at Wembley or been to Wembley before and a chance to win um, first silverware at Arsenal. Yeah, I think honestly today was the first day my brain really switched over to it. Um, uh, we just done some media stuff just then really and it sort of got my mind ticking about Wembley and obviously how big the occasion is and, um, you know, probably be a really big crowd and obviously it's just exciting to be part of any game where you can win silverware and such a, um, you know, historical um, trophy to win. It would be absolutely incredible um, yeah, but I think because we've been going and going and going and you just focus on the game that's right in front of you and it seems like it's a game every three three to two days at the moment, it's not really sunk in. But um, it's definitely a massive occasion and a massive opportunity for us to win some silverware, so it's very exciting. And uh, just my final question, again, with Noelle, I, 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 I had to ask her about Penilla Harder, um, you know, player she knows very well. Obviously, player you know very well, um, playing for Chelsea and Sam Kerr, just signed a new contract. Um, In terms of players you've played, I guess, both with and against, um, where does she rank for you? Um, Yeah, top, top, top. She's uh, one of a kind. She's always been like that. She's She's just a freak of nature in as an athlete, as a footballer. She's just got this sixth sense where she reads the play and, um, you know, she can score from anywhere with left foot, right foot, head. Like, she's just dangerous all the time. I love that I get to play with her, but she's also um, a nightmare to play against. But, um, yeah, she's also a, a pleasure to play against. She's one of those players that, uh, you know, once in a lifetime that challenge you and, and that gets the, be- the best out of you as well. So, um, yeah, she's doing she's doing big things and, you know, knowing her for – you know, most of my life, it's it's fun watching her do these things. Steph, uh, thanks very much. Good luck on Sunday and good luck at Wembley as well. And I uh, really appreciate your time. Of course. Thanks for chatting. No worries. Cheers, Steph. All right. Bye. Okay, so now you've heard from Arsenal left-back Steph Catley ahead of Sunday's FA Cup final between Arsenal and Chelsea at Wembley Stadium. Are you shitting yourself yet? Because I am. Um, but And obviously we'll hear from Noel Maritz at the end of the show. But for this part, the middle bit of the show, uh, Alex and I are going to get a little bit of Chelsea perspective from our guest uh, Jesse, Jesse Parker-Humphreys. Um, who you may well know from the Box to Box podcast, uh, which they're on with Alex. Um, you can also see them in the Independent 442, the Offside Rule, um, and and this this one hurts to say, but the London is Blue podcast. Jesse, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on, guys. Uh, absolute pleasure. Um, f- first off, um, what what are your kind of just pure emotional feelings about Sunday as the big day gets closer? Yeah, I feel like you've summed it up quite well there, like shitting myself 100%. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm excited, but I hate these games. I hate them. Same, same. I'm t- like, I get too anxious in the in these games. I, I say that to like, you know, when I speak to players all the time, I'm just like, God, I don't know how you guys do it because I hate it. But nevertheless, um, anyway, Jesse, just, um, just to get your kind of overall assumption, uh, well, not your assumption, your assessment rather on Chelsea's season so far, six wins in a row. Now, it does seem like, not that Chelsea started the season badly or anything, but it does seem like things are kicking into gear for you guys at the moment. Yeah, I definitely think things have picked up recently. Obviously, losing to Arsenal on the opening day of the season was never going to be a great way to kick things off. And I definitely feel like that result kind of hung over the team for like maybe the first couple of months of the season. Felt like the the shift in formation had left us feeling quite nervous. I felt like the Wolfsburg game where we conceded those like three goals, all of which were just individual errors really typified that. But I definitely think, you know, getting to play and thrash Man City twice has been really good for the side, even if it hasn't necessarily been that big of a test, but you know, like those kind of fixtures, I it just feels like there's a lot more confidence in, in the team going forward now. 
Yeah, and you you referenced. Um, sorry, before I pass over to Alex, uh, you, you re- because you referenced it there. The kind of the move to the back three this season, and Emma kind of. I mean, she said quite plainly. Actually, she didn't imply. She said she wanted to buy a fullback, but but couldn't get one um, in the summer. So there's been a little bit of movement of players uh, within that back three. So not all recognised centre halves and the wing backs are not necessarily all kind of recognised wing backs. Um, what have you made to that uh, about that kind of shift to the back three? And do you think it was a reaction to the Champions League final against Barca? Yeah, I definitely think you know it comes from that because obviously. She- she kind of shifts that back three at, at half time in that game and hasn't really looked back since. I think the thing about the fullbacks is it's kind of interesting because I can see why if we were going to go out and buy one that that would maybe have allowed us to play a back four. But it feels like generally the back three has allowed us to do a lot more in terms of having um, a great variety of attacking players. I think Nila Harder looks a lot more comfortable playing in a, in a front three rather than when she was playing kind of more behind Kerr and Kirby. So I think she's someone who's really benefited from it. Um, I think having getting Guru Wrighton back in the team, which again is something that I don't think we'd have seen happen if, if we'd stuck with a back four, that's obviously really worked well for the team. So I can see why just in general, maybe Hayes wanted a full back, but I don't necessarily know if that means that the back three wouldn't have happened at all. I just wonder if she was looking for someone who would allow her to be able to have maybe more flexibility switching between a back four and a back three. And I think that's something that Chelsea don't really have right now. Yeah, we've we've talked about all of this on the box pod box called podcast to the point where we've gotten complaints. Well, it's not a complaint, but people have, have called us out for talking about this back three because it is so interesting, obviously. Um, yeah, the fullback situation was was a big deal. You know, Barcelona exploited that, and I think Arsenal could exploit that as well. Um, so when you, when we talk about this back three, it also affects where Arsenal have to approach this game. It was you know we got we keep saying that we got lucky that we played Chelsea at the start of the season because they're just figuring out this this back three, and it did take kind of a few games to actually cement it in the way that I think would be beneficial to the way Chelsea play it and everything. Um, so I'm shooting myself also in the perspective that Chelsea have picked up that momentum, whereas Arsenal, we've kind of dropped off a little bit um, the way we started the season. And with a couple of injuries here and there, we can't exploit that those strengths that you would want to exploit in a back three, which is obviously leaving the space on the wings and, and kind of exploiting that space very directly, which of course you want to does but um it should be interesting this sunday i'm sitting with jesse so that's gonna be fun um <laughs> but overall yeah i'm, I'm shitting myself also and uh, uh jesse just um you know alex referenced it there i think when the teams met on the opening day of the season i think most arsenal fans thought when the fixture list came out and you know arsenal have chelsea and man city at home before the end of september uh, Alex and I discussed this on the pod. We were pleased by that. We thought that was good for Arsenal because we were starting the season early. We felt like Arsenal would be in a bit of a rhythm um, at that point. And obviously Chelsea really weren't and, and left a lot of players out who'd been at the Olympics. So I think, you know, we'd have to acknowledge that that was a good time for Arsenal to play Chelsea. Um I personally feel it's a little bit the other way around now for some of the reasons that um, that Alex referenced. Where do you really see this game being kind of won and lost on Sunday? I think it will be in... Oh, I think it's, it, there's, there's two areas. I think what Arsenal did really well in that first opening game was I felt like really they were really good at moving kind of Chelsea centre-backs out of that back three and like making the spaces between them open up a lot. Um, Beth Mead and Vivian Miedemar's movement I thought was really, really effective there. And they're both such good like one-on-one players. Um, And, you know, that was interesting because that was the only game this season where Hayes had actually started... Jess Carter is the right side of centre back, and, and now and basically after that game, she moved Millie Bright to play in that position, and Jess Carter to play in the middle, which I think is what we'll see on Sunday. Um, so whether that will make it Arsenal will find it harder to do that, and whether also Chelsea will just be better at understanding where those those gaps should be and how big they should be, because that's a big thing when you're playing in a back three. Understanding where the space is between your centre backs is obviously a lot different than than when you're in a back four. But the other space that I think will be really interesting is is in that midfield area because. 
I do kind of feel like when you look at Arsenal's midfield, there are spaces to exploit there with the with the runners moving forward. But I also think it's an area where Chelsea have really struggled um, in the league game against Manchester City where I felt City got a lot of joy was having their Caroline Weir and um, Philippa Angadal basically positioned in between um, Chelsea's midfield and defence. And um, Melanie Luports and Jiso Yun, I think, really struggled to figure out how they were supposed to pick up players in those spaces. And a lot of the time, Guru Wrighton was then getting dragged into midfield as well, which was opening up loads more space on that, that right-hand attacking side. So I think that's going to be a really interesting one for Hayes to figure out. In the City game, she took off Jiso Yun at half time because she kind of could, because Chelsea were 2-0 up um, and brought Sophie Ingle on, which kind of stopped that space being there. But I think who Hayes chooses for that double pivot will tell us a lot about her her intentions for that game because I feel like with the City one she she probably knew that Chelsea had had a lot of opportunities to wrap that up early but in a final I don't know if she'll want to take that risk so I think it's going to be really interesting to see and again because you know I think it's really interesting seeing who Jonas Eidabal will pick for that that midfield trio as well because yeah I think I think that matchup could be could be a tricky one and it's obviously naturally where Arsenal will have the overload in in the formation anyway yeah yeah and and who Arsenal choose there will probably be dictated by who's available at the moment and we still don't know about Kim Little and we might need Leo Volti at centre-back because our Arsenal centre-backs are kind of weirdly Arsenal have gone into the season with seven centre-backs and they're pretty much all injured um, at the moment which is very Arsenal but Alex from your point of view I guess from an Arsenal point of view where where can you see Arsenal um, you know if Arsenal are to win this game by hook or by crook, where where do you think the key areas will be? I think overloading the back three, mainly because of Jess Carter starting in that middle. Um, I think that's a really big weak point, and we saw a team like Juventus exploiting that just a little bit. Um, I think it's it's gotten better a lot, but the way that Jess Carter plays in that middle role is that she drops off quite a lot, whereas Millie and Magda keep stay a little bit higher. Um, and I think, as Jesse mentioned, Viv Miedema's movement can be crucial to that. And she'll create a lot of spaces where, and again, this is where you kind of look at the, that midfield. When you have a player like Jordan Nobbs, for example, that's really good at playing higher and making those runs. She's quite comfortable making the runs, picking up the ball as a number nine, for example. Um, I think that could be really well. But again, it's just a domino effect to the back because then you need a midfield that, because obviously Chelsea's first play out is going to be to the midfield in this case because of Jordan Alba moving up, as Jesse mentioned, like playing through that midfield. Um, but I think the back three can be exploited in the way, in the sense that we could play on the wings, you know, have Beth made on one side, for example, um, like heels to line, drag out the, the defenders and have a player like Viv Miedema play with the midfield and exploit that space towards the middle. Um, I think that's going to be the, the biggest bit of it. Now, it's going to be really difficult to for Arsenal to play their usual attacking style of play because of that front three that then that back three enables Chelsea to have. You know, when you have Pernille Harder, Fran Kirby, we'll, we'll see if Harder is hopefully available. Um, but, you know, Pernille Harder, Sam Kerr, Fran Kirby, then you have, you you can't have these fullbacks exploring, like exploiting that much space going forward because you have to deal with that counterattack. Um, so it should be interesting, but I think, yeah, that exploiting that back three in the spaces that they leave and particularly in the middle um, with Carter, I think that's going to be a really big role because, um, yeah, we saw Juventus kind of exploit that just a little bit. And they, and we have, I would say we have better strikers than Juventus overall across the front three. Um, so I think that's where we can kind of get a little bit of joy. Yeah, for for me, from an Arsenal perspective, I, I'm not that fond of the uh, Volti Marnham Little midfield. I don't think there's enough chance creation in it, and the, the the times we've started those players together, it's always required a substitution to unlock the game. So, we started that midfield away at Villa, no goals. Iwabuchi came on at half time, blew the game open. Started that way um, against Spurs away, no goals. Um, until Jordan Nobbs came on and then Manuel Bucci came on later. Started that midfield against Man United, Jordan Nobbs came on at half-time. Um, so I'm I'm not actually that... They're all good players, but I just don't... I, I think basically Arsenal always have to find a way to get one, at least one of Jordan Nobbs, Manuel Bucci or Tobin Heath into the team just because they all do something a little bit different to break the game open. And 
if there's any positive to Arsenal um, having lots of centre backs unavailable, Leo Volti pushing back into the kind of into centre back, that gets Jordan Nobbs in, and that makes me happy, um, frankly. But I think the thing I'm I'm worried about with with Chelsea, or the thing I I'd look for as well, is that um, you know. Jesse's mentioned Guro Wrighton playing at left wing back, and I think Guro Wrighton's a superb player. But that big diagonal from Millie Bright to um, to Guro Wrighton, I think, is 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 really really key. And we know that that's why Emma Hayes, one of the reasons anyway, Emma Hayes likes having Millie Millie Bright so much in that defence. But um, Jesse, just to change tack a little bit for a minute, because obviously we talk mainly about Arsenal on this podcast uh, as quote unquote insiders. What have you made um, of Arsenal this season and particularly the difference um, between them under Jonas Eideval compared to, let's say, the last season under Joe Montemoro? I think the thing that's mainly stood out to me or definitely at the very, very start was just energy and intensity. And I feel like that was something that under Montemoro, it just didn't feel like you speaking you know specifically as a Chelsea fan you worried about when you're playing Arsenal it never felt like it was going to be a game where you could just like lose control of it and the funny thing is is Chelsea are quite easily rattled a lot of the time so I actually think that high intensity and I think that's why you know in that opening game Chelsea struggled so much because you know it's a bit like the Champions League final when teams come at us we do have a bit of a tendency to crumble and, and we can crumble really spectacularly um so, but I really also do like the the pushing up of Kim Little or whoever's kind of in that number 10 position, I guess, and, and having those runners into the box. I think we've seen that um, be really effective against a lot of teams. Um, and also, you know, being able to really, I know this is more, I guess, a personnel thing than maybe an Idaval thing, but being able to have that Catley McCabe link up on the left. I know, Tim, that you said um, on, on your last podcast that you haven't always been like necessarily wild about it, but I think it's, I think it has looked really effective, especially in that, in that United game. Um, so, yeah, but I think really the intensity thing is very interesting to me because, I'm always fascinated in how teams can maintain that across both 90 minutes and a season because the nature of, I feel like high pressing teams is that there are always going to be moments where that energy is going to drop. And if the, a team relies too much on that energy, which I don't think we've really seen from Arsenal so far, but maybe in, in that Spurs game, in that Villa game, you've started to see those moments. And I think at points it's felt like maybe because the confidence is so high within the squad, um, it's almost like the spectacular has like happened more often than you even you see like, you know, McCabe's lobs, like she's a fantastic player and I love seeing her do that, but like, they're not the kind of goals you want to rely on as a team. So I'm really intrigued to see how, as maybe Arsenal players like adjust to life under Idaval, what, what happens with, with those kind of moments. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, I think Tobin Heath and Mane Iwabuchi could be really key players in the second half of the season for Arsenal in terms of breaking some of those games open, um, particularly with moments, moments of skill, taking players on, finding a pass. I do think Arsenal have lacked that by their standards um, in the last few games. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask, um, you, you spoke, Jesse, about Penilla Harder and, um, and the kind of role she's played this year. One of the things I thought about Chelsea last season was that maybe that Harder, Kirby, Kerr, it didn't feel like a trio to me. It felt like it felt like a, a double act with um, with a bit of a side woman in Vanilla Harder, and obviously she's so good that 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 doesn't really matter. But how you know you mentioned there that she's been able to be a bit more central. Do you think we're we're closer to seeing like the absolute best of Vanilla Harder at Chelsea? Yeah, I think this injury that she's picked up came at just like the worst time for her because it really felt like she just started the season like hands down Chelsea's best player um she got us out has got us out of a lot of trouble this season um with her goal scoring and it just feels like she's really hit her stride within this team both in terms of like how and where she's playing but also just I feel like a bit of a confidence I don't know whether just you know maybe feeling like a bit like a side woman as you said because it, it was kind of like that 
had maybe just got into her head a little bit, but I feel like her attitude this season has been a lot more like, oh, this is like my team and I'm actually the best player in this, um, which I think has really benefited the side. I definitely think before when she was just sat behind Kerr and Kirby, she was having to do a lot of like dirty work, which I just don't really think suits her. I never really felt like super, it never felt like it was super benefiting the team in any way. Um, But I think now playing her as a front three, it allows her to drop back and pick up those pockets of space still from a more like a 10 position, but also actually interact with Kerr and Kirby, you know, something that I've, think is really always exciting about Chelsea's attacking play and makes it so hard to defend against is the way that those players can move in and out of each other's spaces and and therefore drag players out of position. And I actually think adding a third player to that it, across the line, it just only makes it stronger. Whereas before it just felt like you had kind of Kerr and Kirby kind of maybe Kerr going out to the wing and Kerr becoming a bit more central. But now when you've got three players circulating and doing it, and it's something that Jesse Fleming does really well too, which is why I think she's slotted in also so well in that position. And in many ways, I think she is a very similar player to, to Harder. Um, but it's going to be really interesting to see if Hayes starts her at the weekend. I don't think she will, personally. I think Jesse Fleming will start just because I would be really surprised if Hayes wanted to risk it with harder having played zero minutes for, for like the past three weeks, basically it just, it just wouldn't make sense to me. Um, I'm hoping she'll be on the bench and you know, she's, she's a great option to bring on obviously if, if she is fit, but I, uh, yeah, I'm not sure if we'll see her start. Yeah. I think there are a few players, um, certainly in the Arsenal camper in, in that, in that kind of, uh, in that scenario as well. Alex, a, a question I'll ask you is, um, I've kind of noticed the last couple of weeks, um, Emma Hayes, I think, you know, maybe starting the mind games um, with the onus a little bit. Um, So I'll give you two example quotes. She spoke, um, I think, just before the international break about, you know, there's one point between Arsenal and Chelsea, but it was very, you know, Arsenal leading and all the pressures on them and we'll hunt them down and, you know, pointed standard stuff that I think, um, I think you do when you really realize who your opponents for the title are. But another one that was quite pointed that I'm not sure a lot of people picked up was um, just after Jonas gave a press conference and, you know, he's spoken a lot about international commitments and, you know, wanting international players to be a bit more, uh, teams to be a bit more reasonable with Arsenal players, particularly with the Olympics. And Emma said something in her press conference about um, managers injure players. <laughs> um, and and I, I, again, I thought that was a little bit pointed. Um, and again, like not something I'm enormously upset about. I think it's just standard kind of, jousting and I know Emma's been in this position a lot of times before I, I wondered whether you'd picked up on that uh, and how you see that developing not just um, kind of maybe even post Sunday whatever the result is but across the season yeah Emma Hayes uh, mind games is, is always fun to follow um, no I think it's just, I think it's standard but I also think kind of getting to know Jonas more and more through the press conference that he does and the way he answers certain questions. I honestly can say that he's probably not too bothered about any of it. Um, I mean, just the way, if you, if you ask him these, you know, these similar questions where Emma Hayes will give you that headline quote of, you know, just taking a little dig at the other team, Jonas would just be, he's a very dry person in terms of he just, when, when people describe him as direct, he's very direct. Um, So I honestly don't think like if you ask him to answer it, he'll probably give you like, yeah, I'm not listening to any of that. Like I'm just focusing on my, on my team and stuff, but it is, yeah, it's, it's interesting to see the dynamics of Chelsea and Arsenal because now it's Emma Hayes versus Jonas Eidoval. And I think they're completely different in the way they approach kind of the team and the media and everything. I think he's very Scandinavian in terms of being just very, um, kind of just straight to the point, very direct, you know, more like colder than Emma Hayes is, you know, Emma Hayes loves to play around with, with journalists and likes to play around press conferences and kind of not giving any in the way. And Jonas isn't really scared of giving much away. You know, he'll still give you the, the good answer of, of tactics of, of team selection and all that. Whereas Emma Hayes will be kind of a bit more reserved about it. Um, which annoys me if I'm being quite honest, but overall, I think, yeah, I think I don't really 
care about what Emma Hayes says because I've, I've kind of stopped. There's only so much that you can take because if you want actual information, you know, Emma Hayes is not the person that's going to give it to you. Um, but in terms of Jonas and, and Emma and how I think he takes it, I think he couldn't care less about what she says, um, if I'm being very blunt. So it should be, I think that the dynamic, I think Joe is a bit more playful in the, in the sense that he'll probably pick it up and kind of play with it just a bit more. But I think Jonas is very definitely just does not care and he'll just go about his stuff um, the way he does. So I think the head to head of Sunday, like on the pitch is going to be just as interesting off the pitch and and the way that Jonas and Emma Hayes kind of both handled the, the pressure and kind of what's happening. So um, yeah, I think, I think that's where I stand on that. My yeah. favorite Hayes dig came. I don't know if you guys heard this, but she did um, Wrighty's house, the live Wrighty's house um, with the Stadio guys and Ian Wright. And um, she made some drive about saying, oh, do you think Jonas Idaval likes the cameras? Which I thought was quite funny. <laughs> <laughs> she's, definitely, uh, she's definitely going for it. Yeah, yeah. I, I sensed like a little bit of irritation, I think, in that Arsenal-Chelsea game because, you know, Jonas is very demonstrative and was demonstrative at the final whistle. Like, I sensed a little bit of ir- irritation there, which which I kind of think is fine. Like, if you've just lost a game and the other manager's celebrating, I, I it would irritate me um, as well, to be honest. But ju- just to put a coda on what Alex said, like, yeah, definitely Jonas is straight as an arrow. He was asked, like, after the Spurs game about, like... Um, you know, is is it good like for the North London derby to be more competitive? And he was just like, I, I don't care about that. That's that's not for me. <laughs> and uh, which is exactly like that. That's the answer that every manager would be thinking in their head. But I'm not sure all of them would say it. Um, before and Alex, just fair warning. Fair warning to you both. I'm going to ask you both for your predicted lineups in a minute. So think about that in the background. But Jesse, first, I wanted to ask you. We were just talking about Penilla Harda, obviously a player that's just come back um, for Chelsea. Well, I say come back, come in really, because um, she hadn't really been involved until now. Is Lauren James? Um, how do you see? Because that that was Chelsea's big signing um, over the summer in, in an area of the pitch where I think most people would look at the Chelsea squad and say it, it was pretty crowded already. How do you see Lauren fitting in? Yeah, I think it's going to be a really interesting one. I think she is definitely one for the future because although, you know, Chelsea's attacking talent is very crowded, I do sometimes look at the age profile of Chelsea's team and start to think, oh, like uh, there's, we're going to need some important signings quite soon because even with Frank Herbie and Penila Harder and, and even Guru Wrighton, they're all kind of approaching that, that late 20s bit. And especially with a player like, um, Kirby, who's been incredibly injury prone um, over the years, even leading, leaving aside her, her pericarditis, I can see why actually it made quite a lot of sense for Chelsea to to strengthen that area. And then also there was obviously just the feeling that they could come in and pick up a player who is both supremely talented and a massive commercial coup for the club because of her brother. Um, I think she is a player who Chelsea can really use effectively. I think her ability to dribble with the ball, to take players on. It's something actually that not many of the Chelsea attacking players really look to do that often. Now, I don't know whether that's just because Hayes doesn't really like players to do that within her system and whether it's something that we might see Lauren James do less of over time, but definitely from her kind of first two appearances, okay, it's probably been about a combined total of 30 minutes. We've seen her looking to, to take on players to go past them and she's looked really effective doing that. She's looked really sharp and we've, seen Chelsea really struggle to deal with low blocks a lot. I mean, we really act a lot of the time as a counter-attacking side, I think, and that that's where a lot of our success has come from over the years. But obviously, increasingly, I think as the level of teams in the WSL has risen, the tactical level hasn't necessarily. So I feel like now you've just got better low blocks, um, which I think we've really seen Chelsea struggle with getting past, you know, games against Villa and Leicester spring to mind. So I think Lauren James is going to offer a really great option in those games, whether that is starting or just playing 30 minutes to kind of come in and just offer something a little bit different going forward. But as I say, I don't think she's going to be someone we're seeing picking up loads of minutes over the this season at the very least. Yeah, interesting. I, I kind of look at her almost like in terms of Arsenal signing Tobin Heath as like the reverse Tobin 
in that like a similar type of player really in the similar kind of oh we don't really have that type of player but obviously a very very different end of their their career trajectory um so the time is upon us alex i hope i hope you've been thinking about it um not what would you do what do you think Jonas Eidevel's starting 11 will be on sunday have fun because obviously I, we don't know much about the injuries and there's still games to play on international break. I'm not going to jinx it though. I'm knocking, knocking on wood everywhere. Um, I think, I think he's probably not going to change Noel Maritz and Steph Catley as fullbacks. Um, and then of course, Kate McKay will be pushed up on, I mean, the front three is most likely I think the most efficient front three that have been for the way that Jonas wants to play is definitely Mick Miedema, um across the front. Um, I think center backs, I think, I don't think he has an option. I think he needs to play Leo Valti as a center back because of the experience and the calmness that you won't get, um, if Jen B.E. doesn't play, for example, but even at that, I think Leo Valti is, is a good replacement for Leo Williamson's strengths, which is obviously holding the ball, distributing really well, the long passes, um, just controlling the tempo a bit more than if you have Jen B.E. in Lata, it's a, I think they're both players, and I've said it before, they're both players that play good with someone better next to them in terms of distribution. And actually, you know, they're good at the dirty work, the side tackles, the headers, the intersections or everything. But when it comes to, especially when you, you have to compare it to Leo Williamson, because she's so big on that. But I think he needs to play Leo Valti um, as center back. Um, and that's also because I think she'll work well with the midfield, whoever is in there. And especially if you have, I think Frida Manum is 100% going to start. I don't think there's any, like, I think that's probably the most secure player that you have in a Jonas Eidebel side at the moment. Um, I think Frida Manum will, will definitely start in that pivot role. Um, I think she can do well with Leo Valti behind her because I think that gives Leo Valti space to come up and play with her. Um, I don't, that doesn't really make much sense, but I think they'll do really well together because um, when they both play in the midfield, it gets a bit slow in terms of progressing the ball forward. I think Leo Valti slows that down a lot more than, than what Frida does. I think they're quite opposite players when it comes to playing that role. Um, so I think Frida, yeah, Frida has a six. Uh, this is where it gets hard. The next two, because I agree with everything that, that we've spoken about that. I think that midfield needs a bit more creativity where if you have, you know, the Leo Valti, Frida Man and Kim Lil, for example, it's a very, very, there's no, it's not dull because it's still really good football, but it's just not the uh, the energy, the, the high press, the, the creativity more than anything. Um, I think Jordan Obbs needs to start in that um, for the reason that I said earlier that I think Jordan is really good at, at exploiting a lot of space in the middle and making really good runs where I think someone like Frida Manum can play into her quite often. Um, and then oh, I think Kim Little should be good there. I think my middle three would be Freedom Man and Jordan Obbs, Kim a little, little um, because I think Kim is that is going to be that that kind of balance between the three of them. She's played with Jordan for X amount of years. She's played with Freedom Man for a lot of minutes this season already, and I think she'll be good in that in that middle position um, where she can defend. Obviously, she recovers the ball really really well, so I think that's going to be good. Um, so yeah, that's gonna that's gonna be it. That's gonna be a middle three. Make media make meet them up top. Steph Catley, Noel Maritz, uh, Leo Valti, and Lata in the center back role, and then Freedom Man and Kim Little and Jordan Nobbs. Uh, I'm going to regret that, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> that's that's exactly what I think it will be. I'm I'm actually um I'm I'm really okay with Leo Valti at centre back for reasons you said about her distribution. Also, I think a weakness for Arsenal without Leo Williamson is that the other centre halves aren't that quick, but Leo Valti's She's quick across the ground. She's got re- good recovery. Um, whereas like Jen, um, Vicky Schnaderbeck, Simone Boy, not as quick along the ground. And the way Chelsea play as well, um, I'm actually a bit more comfortable maybe um, with Leo Volti. But yeah, de- definitely. And then that will kind of, that will make the, the midfield three pick itself because I don't think Mane or Bucci will be, will be considered to start. I think she'll come off the bench and... One of the things we saw um, when Arsenal last played Chelsea, Frieda Marnham really coming over to that left-hand side to create an overload with uh, Katie McCabe. And Jordan does that really well. Um, so I think Jordan can pick up that role, no problem. And like I said, I just always feel better when Jordan Nobbs is in the side. So Jesse, what do you think Emma Hayes' starting eleven will be on Sunday? 
You guys doing that lineup thing just made me like extra nervous. <laughs> it's like when you just like list all these names, it was like, <laughs> um, okay, Hayes. Uh, yeah, I think it'll be Ann Catherine Berger and Goal. I think she'll go with the back three of Bright, Carter, and Ericsson. I did kind of wonder if Marin Mielder got minutes with Norway of the international break, whether she'd put Mielder in just simply because I think that is. Chelsea's best back three, but she hasn't played at all. So I, I don't really see that happening. Um, Guru Ryson on the left and Aaron Cuthbert on the right. Um, I think in the midfield, this is probably the most interesting decision um, formation wise, because I felt like G So Young was one of the few players who came out of that opening season game with a large amounts of credit. I think she was really able to exploit some of the spaces that kind of came as McKay pushed forward and, and Manum came across as well. Um, but, and I think this is really a question of who partners with Melanie Lupoltz because I think she'll, she'll be one of them. Um, but I just wonder if Hayes will look to be a bit more cautious and play Sophia Ingle just to give a bit more defensive solidity. And I think the thing that's nudging me to pick Ingle ahead of G as well is the fact that G is coming back from Korea and Sophia Ingle is coming back from Wales. I, I've, we've seen a couple of times a season when they've been international breaks that Hayes has really looked to rest G on a lot. So I just feel like internally, it seems there's a bit of a lack of a willingness to play her straight off an international break anyway. So I think it will be Ingle and Lupoltz in midfield. And then I think we will see a front three of Jesse Fleming, Sam Kerr and Frank Kirby. Um, Sam Kerr is obviously coming back from Australia, like a couple of the, the Arsenal girls too. So that'll be like a bit of an interesting one. I think if Beth England hadn't been so rubbish this season, she might have been looking like a start for some of these things, but I just think Kerr is just so far ahead of England at this moment in time that there's no way um, Kerr doesn't start, especially because there was also this bizarre thing that Hayes said after the Manchester City semi-final where she said she could only start Kerr because if she came off the bench, she'd be too tired. Don't know what that means. Don't know, don't know the logic there. Um, but so, yeah, I, I think I think we'll see Kerr. And um, yeah, again, Pneel Harder, I think, hopefully off the bench. But classic Hayes, got no idea what is wrong with her or how long she's supposed to be out. So I've honestly got no idea if she's, even fit enough. I know she can walk because she was at Chelsea's Ballon d'Or ceremony at Stamford Bridge last night. But apart from that, I, I've got no idea whether she's been on a football pitch in the past week or so. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I think both clubs will be doing like an open training session. I know Arsenal will on Friday, so that might give us some more answers um, unless the managers keep their, their kind of their cards close to their chest. I kind of agree with you in that I think that Emma Hayes will start look to start this game fairly conservatively because I think she'll want to avoid what happened in September where Arsenal kind of began to run away with the game until the 70th minute and then Chelsea were chasing. I think that she'll think if it's nil-nil at half-time with players like Harder um, on the substitutes bench that... Uh, and potentially G as well. Um, I, I think she'll look at it that way. I think she'll look at it. Let's keep it fairly tight. Let's keep Arsenal, you know, keep Arsenal in a box, and then you know, towards the end, we can kind of pull out some of the some of the more attacking players. But I, I think it's going to be fascinating um, tactically. I do think Chelsea will have learned some lessons because Arsenal, the way they're playing at the moment, were a real. They were a real kind of unknown quantity back in September and they're not anymore. And I think we're seeing that at the moment. But yeah, th this this is a game that's, it's a bit of a coin toss. I wouldn't be surprised if it went extra time, penalties, any of that. Um, and I'm already scaring the shit out of myself saying that. However, that's all we've got time for on this section of the show. So Alex, thanks as ever. As always, a pleasure. And Jesse, thank you so much. And uh, do tell the people where um, they can follow you on Twitter. Uh, you can find me on Twitter if you want to follow a Chelsea fan <laughs> at Jesse JPH. That's absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much. And we will be back in part three where I will be talking to Arsenal right back Noel Maritz. When you were growing up, like, how did you... Like, did you feel more American or more Swiss or a bit of both? Like, how was that for you growing up? Um, I think a bit of both. I mean, obviously, like you mentioned, um, I was born and kind of raised in California. Um, but my parents always spoke Swiss German 
um, and English with me at home. And usually in winter or in summer, we would always fly to um, Switzerland to see my relatives and everything. So I was always very connected to Switzerland, but obviously also to the U.S. just because, yeah, I grew up there and, yeah, lived there for quite a bit. And how did that um, influence, like, your football education at all? Did you start playing when you are in the U.S.? Yeah, um, I started yeah. when I was really young, when I was four years old. Um, I mean, my, my dad used to play, my brother played, so I eventually also got kind of just pulled into that, um, yeah, football life. Um, yeah, so I started really young, and I feel like in America, I mean, obviously, um, girls and women's football is very, very popular. So I do think that from a young age, it was already, yeah, already kind of a bit more professional than I think than in, in Europe. So it was like very, very much um, about developing and a lot of techni technical stuff. Um, so, yeah, I think it was very, very good um, just for my development in, the, in my young years. Yeah. And do you feel like that was that perhaps I, I don't know whether you feel like that kind of translates for you as a player, having kind of grown up playing in two very different kind of football slash soccer cultures, whether they they both have an influence on you or whether or, or not? Yeah, for sure. No, for sure. Um, like I said, in, in America, um, I played with the all girls team always until I was 10 years old. Um, so yeah, and I had really good coaches, really good facilities, um, and everything. And then obviously when I came to Switzerland, I did start playing, um, with girls, but eventually played for more than three years with the boys, um, which then also really, really helped me, um, develop, um, into, into a player just on a physical side, um, just playing against boys, but also playing with the boys. Everything was, yeah, I think a bit faster and, um, yeah, just really good, for me progressing um yeah and developing and um looking back uh, on your time at wolfsburg um you know obviously a very successful time for you um you know quite early in your career winning like all of those cups and the champions league and the league um now you've you've kind of been away for 18 months and arsenal for that time like how do you look back on your time at wolfsburg and and how it developed you as a player um, yeah, I mean, I really, really enjoyed my time at Wolfsburg. Obviously, I went there when I was very young, when I was 17, and I had the chance to to already train on a very, very high level with yeah, world-class players when I was still that young. So I did profit a lot from that, just the, just the trainings in general, and then also, um, obviously the, the games when I did get, um, yeah, much playing time. Um, so, yeah, I do think also because I moved away from home pretty, pretty early, it just yeah helped me in my development, not only in, as a player, but also as in a, in a human. Um, but yeah, I won a lot of trophies in, in Wolfsburg, very spoiled there. Um, yeah, no, we had a great team. I, I enjoyed it a lot. Like I said, I was there for seven years. Um, I made a lot of good friends. Um, yeah, played with um, amazing players together. Um, so, yeah, that was that was a really good time for me and, and I enjoyed it a lot. Yeah. And another trophy coming on December the 5th. Um, <laughs> yes. Arsenal, but, um, <laughs> and then, you know, you came to Arsenal 18 months ago. Um, how did that move um, develop? Like when did you first speak to Arsenal? And I wonder how much you spoke to Leo Valti um, in advance of that. Um, yeah. I mean, obviously my contract was up in uh, Wolfsburg and I do, I did want to, just, you know, take another step in my career, just, um, you know, do something different. Um, I was in Wolfsburg for a very long time. I mean, um, I, I, I loved it there. I, I enjoyed it, but I just thought for me, it was the moment to, to um, try something new. And yeah, when I did then get in, in the, the interest from, from Arsenal, obviously I did speak to Leah quite a bit. Um, yeah, she's been here for a while and um, yeah, asked her a lot of questions and um, yeah, I just spoke to her her a lot in general, just about everything, everything at the club. I had a lot of good conversations with Joe back then and just thought it would be the right move for me um, yeah, to make the next step in my in my career. Um, yeah. And um, Jonas this season has, has kind of highlighted your performances a lot, like in our post-match press conferences, um, particularly after the City game, uh, you know, talking about how you you kind of took on Lauren Hemp, one of the one of the best left wingers in the league. 
And, you know, last season, like a lot of players, you had some injuries. And I wonder whether at the moment you feel like Arsenal fans are probably really seeing um, really seeing you as a player this season. Um, yeah, I mean, for sure. Like, uh, I've been happy that I've been been fit and, um, yeah, have, have been doing well. But I think just in general, the whole team has been, um, yeah, doing amazing, um, especially... I think we've been really been working on our defensive work, um, which also makes it then a bit easier for the defending line. Um, so, yeah, I think just a bit of change in the style of play since Jonas's came has really, um, yeah, brought us up to the next level, the next step. Um, so I think, yeah, the whole team has been been doing amazing. Um, everybody's been, been really stepping it up and playing great games. So I think for, for, for me in my position or just as a back line, um, it's always nice to have everyone, yeah, working defensively, having that structure, and then yeah, it makes you makes you look a bit better then. <laughs> and um, I was I was going to ask that actually about the kind of change in style under Jonas, and I think um, I, I wondered whether you, you know because there's like more of an emphasis on high pressing, but and we know how that impacts certainly the midfielders and the forwards. And I wondered whether it impacted your game um, at all, whether you'd noticed it impacting your game. And I know, like Arsenal, it's the left back tends to go forward a little bit more than you and you kind of tuck mm-hmm. in. Um, but I, I wondered whether just purely in your position, you've really noticed any change or whether it's just been business as usual. Um, I mean, yeah, obviously there's been a bit of change just because like, yeah, a bit our whole structure kind of um, changed a bit. Um but yeah, Jonas, he really likes the high press, just reacting really fast, lightning fast, and he really highlights that. So it's always good then to have that kind of a reminder um, in the game. But um, I think in my style of play, it hasn't um, yeah, impacted or changed a lot in the perspective of my, of my position. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's just good. Um, yeah, the way he highlights things and the way that, that he wants, like his style of play, like I said, like reacting fast, pressing, um, just really being being present every time and every moment of the game. So, yeah. And obviously looking forward to the, the cup final against Chelsea at Wembley and um, that, that Chelsea game on the first game of the season at the Emirates, um, real, real kind of high moment, um, even though it was the first game of the season, it felt really significant. I wonder um, how, how you experienced that day and whether you think that will have any impact at all on, on the cup final at Wembley? Um, yeah, I mean, the game at the Emirates, I mean, obviously it was, it was amazing just to have, um, yeah, such a crowd and playing playing at the stadium. My parents came, saw me first time uh, play live at a live match for Arsenal, just because of the COVID situation, they never could come. So that was, yeah, that was a great game. And then, yeah, I mean, obviously... The win um, over Chelsea, um, yeah, great start of the season for us. Um, so yeah, Wembley will will be a big challenge. Um, so yeah, I think Chelsea, um, obviously they they're coming for us. So um, yeah, um, no, I'm, I'm really looking forward to the to the game at Wembley. Obviously, a final. Um, I've never been to Wembley, never played at Wembley. So um, yeah, I think it will be a big highlight in my career. And obviously, yeah, we'll do everything we can. Um, to yeah, to win and take the trophy um, back to Arsenal. And um, I, mean, I mean, I appreciate she tends to play on the right for Chelsea, but obviously you know Penilla Harder um, mm-hmm. very well. Um, and well, I gather there might be an injury question mark over her anyway. But um, just how, in in terms of players you've played with, where does she rank? Oh uh, yeah, she's definitely very very high up the list. Uh, yeah, she's an incredible player um I really enjoyed playing with her at Wolfsburg she's yeah like we see when she plays at Chelsea she's a she's a player that can really change the game and make a big impact um yeah especially going forward scoring goals I think she's always kind of there where where you need her she can really create um yeah a lot of chances um so she's definitely a a world-class player um yeah for sure I enjoyed more playing with her than against her (laughs) um but uh, yeah, so yeah, it will be. I think it it will be a challenging game for us. Um, I mean, I think every game against Chelsea um, is is a big one. So yeah, I think everyone's really looking forward to it. And yeah. And uh, my my final question is just looking ahead to the Euros, which are obviously 
feel like they're a long way away um, <laughs> next summer. But yeah. um, I, I spoke to Leah a couple of months ago just about the, that playoff um, that you guys had against against Czech Republic. Yeah. Uh, and that evening, um, and she kind of said, I spoke to her about the penalty she took and she that, that brilliant penalty into the top corner and she just said, I was so tired that I couldn't be nervous. <laughs> and uh, it, it sounded like um, emotionally and physically quite a draining uh, kind of evening. But in terms of your career with all the stuff you've won, where does that night and kind of qualifying for the Euros kind of rank in your career? Uh, yeah, I definitely say it's a big moment um, in my career um yeah we, we kind of had like the past yeah one two years we had like a bit of a change in our national team and kind of like a rough a rough patch and obviously it was it was just, uh, amazing that we could qualify for the euros i mean especially because i think it's going to be a massive event um for women's football in england so i mean obviously you want to you want to be there and compete with the best um so yeah, no, it was it was a great moment. Like you said, the game was very, was very tiring and and draining. But um, yeah, I think we were all very very relieved and just happy that we um, qualified uh, for the Euros. Um, yeah, it will be an amazing summer. I think. I think yeah, it will be a great event here in London. So um, uh, in England. So yeah, it will be cool. Thanks, Noel. Um, and best of luck at Wembley. Best of luck on Sunday. Um, yeah, thank you. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for that. Really appreciate your time. No worries. See you soon. Bye. Bye. And that's all we have time for for this month's episode. Hope you really enjoyed it. Huge thanks to our guests, Steph Catley, Noel Maritz and Jesse Parker Humphreys, uh, as well as uh, co-host Alex Ibaceta. Huge game on Sunday. Um, really, really nervous about it. Going to be de- decided by very small details, I think. Arsenal obviously beat Chelsea the last time the two teams met back in September, but obviously things have changed since then. Arsenal have got some injury issues. Chelsea have hit their stride um, a little bit this season, but this is a game that really could go all the way, and I'm already tremendously nervous about it. So um, if you can get to Wembley on Sunday, get to Wembley. If you're already going to Wembley on Sunday, enjoy. Come on, you gunners, etc. Um, otherwise, the game will be available to watch live wherever you are. I absolutely guarantee that. And in the UK, it will be on BBC One. Sunday, 5th of December, 2 p.m. kickoff. Arsenal FA Cup winners 15 times, 14 times, sorry. Um, I'm already already jumping ahead of myself there. It will be their 15th FA Cup victory, by far and away the most number of FA Cups won in women's football. Um, Let's go add another one, shall we? Come on, you gunners. (laughs) 